Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MLA's first Sheep Projections webinar for 2022. Thanks very much for your patience um, in kicking off the uh, webinar. Just one or two small technical issues that I know that we've all experienced in the past, so thanks for that. Today we'll be discussing MLA's first Sheep Projections released for 2022. And the key focuses here today will be the growth of the national flock, the continued strengthening of lamb slaughter, and a reband in slaughter number volumes as our flock growth matures. Thanks first up for your patience and taking the time to attend today. My name is Steve Jaffrey and I'll be the moderator. I'm MLA's Data Transformation Manager. Um, I'm responsible for National Livestock Reporting Service and also creating those tools that allow MLA teams like our market information group here to create better insights for the industry from that vast array of data that MLA collects. The team presenting today and taking you through the February release of our projections will be Steve Bignall, the MLA Market Information Manager, and Ripley Atkinson, the MLA Market Information Analyst. Steve, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, thanks, Steve Jaffrey or Jaffa. Um, no, I'm Steve Bignall and I'm the Market Information Manager at MLA. Uh, originally, I'm from a Merino DORPA mixed cropping enterprise in Coconut, Western Australia. And as the Market Information Manager, my team looks after all the supply, production and pricing side insights from a domestic uh, point of view. Uh, contact details have been provided there in case anyone wants to follow up if they have any questions following the uh, today's webinar. Thanks. Ripley? Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name's Ripley Atkinson. I'm the Market Information Analyst for the MLA, uh, originally from Tamworth in northwest New South Wales, from a Merino beef and summer and winter cropping operation. Within my role at the organisation, I deliver and prepare the both the sheep and cattle projections, which are released three and four times a year, respectively. And then the development and the delivery of the state of the industries report, which the MLA expects to deliver to industry in late September, October of this year. And also the MLA AWI sheep meat survey, and of course, general day-to-day -day analysis and supporting the industry on the domestic supply and livestock pricing of the red meat industry. Cheers, thanks Dean, thanks Rip. So we've provided our contact details in the slides today. So please don't hesitate that if you have any market information questions relating to supply and domestic pricing, reach out to us and, and, and let us know. Just before we start the Prezo, I'd like just to cover a few housekeeping points. Um, first up, I um, just want to flag that all participants um, will be on mute throughout the presentation. Um, we are putting aside 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. So um, please feel to free to enter those questions uh, at any time throughout the presentation via the Q&A um, function that's located on the top right hand corner of your screen in front of you there. Look, we will work hard to get through all those questions, um, but any questions that we, we don't get to, um, we'll definitely take on notice, yeah? Um, important to note that the webinar today is being recorded uh, and a copy of that recording will be uploaded to MLA's website um, and we will definitely share it with today's participants upon request. Um, the full projections document um, was released last Tuesday, uh, and again, it's available on the website under the Trends and Analysis page. Um, they'll also be circulated in today's edition of MLA's weekly email newsletter, The Weekly. Um, also, a favour to ask, uh, at the back end of the um, webinar, uh, we'll be, you'll be prompted to fill out a, a feedback survey. So this survey is rather important for us because it assists the market information team to just improve and better tune their offerings um, and better suit your needs. Um, so without any further ado, let's uh, launch into the content for today's projections. The first question that, um, that I have here uh, is for you, Steve. What are the key takeaways from MLA's first release of this year? So there's three key takeaways from the projections this year. It's that the flock, the first point there, the flock will continue to grow. So it's going to grow uh, to 74.4 million head this year, uh, following a growth of uh, t nearly 11% in 2021. And we do have growth tapering as uh, the flock move, the rebuild moves into 2023 and 2024. And at the moment, most of that flock rebuild in 2021 
will in 2021 and 2022 is coming from New South Wales and Victoria. WA, which is the third biggest sheep producing state, had great season in 2021. So we expect that uh, state's rebuild influence to grow into 2022 and 2023. The second point there is lamb slaughter will increase uh, 7% in 2022 to 20, uh, 21.6 million head. And the third piece is on the back of increased slaughter and record high carcass weights. We expect uh, lamb production and export records to be broken both this year and next. This year, 307,000 tonnes of lamb will be exported. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, Ripley, question to yourself, mate. In 2021, uh, the national for flock was forecast to grow by 10.1% upwards to 70.8 million head. What can we expect of the flock in 2022? Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Jaffa. Uh, in 2022, we expect the flock to grow by 4.9% or 3.75 million head uh, to 74.4 million head this year. And uh, as Steve mentioned a moment ago, New South Wales and Victoria will do the heavy lifting with the increase in flock size for this year. Um, WA had a strong autumn and winter rainfall period last year, but we would like to see them experience a similar scenario in regards to rain for their autumn and winter uh, season in 2022 to really support and accentuate that rebuild moving forwards. This revision uh, of this figure of 74.4 million head is a revision upwards from our October numbers. Numbers uh, this year for this uh, release are higher by 1.1 million head compared to October and the continuation, a strong you know, end to spring and summer rainfall period has really supported um, the continuation of strong landing percentages. Uh, remaining you know, more favourable and a forecast milder start to the cooler months of the year will certainly support um, our assumptions in regarding to lamb survival rates and, and the continuation of strong available pasture and grazing conditions. Looking ahead, pardon me, out to 2023, we expect the flock growth to continue but to, to taper off and mature at a more steady level. So um, the flock we do forecast to reach its highest level since 2009 in 2023 at 76.2 million head and that would be a, a, a figure higher by 8% compared to our 2021 numbers. Out to 2024, the flock's expected to grow marginally, lifting to 76.8 million head or 0.7% higher than the 2023 number. And as the national flock grows, we have factored into our modelling the potential for the, the seasonal conditions um, playing a role or, or, or altering from where they are at the minute. Those slowing growth rates for 23 and 24 at 2.6% and 0.7% reflect that um, flock growth maturing that we're talking about and, and factoring in the turn in the seasonal conditions or the potential for that to occur. That's great. Thanks, Rip. Um, a question back to yourself, Steve. You mentioned just a bit earlier on um, weather conditions. Can you discuss a bit further what the, the those weather assumptions are that are underpinning yep. our projections here today? Yeah, thanks, Jaffa. So when we did the projections back in December and January, we got the bomb forecast for January through to March, so summer and at the end of summer and in the start of autumn, and they were for a wetter summer and start to autumn than our average. On the screen there, we have uh, from March through to May, and as you'll see there, it's sort of wetter to average on that left map. Um, so, and the heat isn't too extreme, which is the map on the, on the on the right. So looking through really from January to May, we expect wetter to average conditions are for most of Australia and especially those Southern sheep producing regions. So that really underpinned a great start to the season. Uh, one thing we know that that means that the dams will be full, there'll be great soil moisture and, and we know that we have a lot of grain from last year. So should the conditions turn, it wouldn't be a mass liquidation like we saw in 2019 nationally. When we did the projections back in January, uh, BOM had the La Nina continuing through to autumn and it, there wasn't sort of com commentary past that. We, at the time, re, uh, the model showed that three Laninas, three consecutive Laninas was rare. We know we had one in 20, 
20 slash 2021, northern summer 21 into 2022, the summer we've just gone through was one. And so we knew from our modelling it was unlikely that we were really going to get that third La Nina into 22, 23. Um, we did have it in the 70s and the 90s, but we knew it was rare. So that's sort of the assumptions that underpinned our modelling. And I suppose that change in season or the stable stabilising of the seasons is why we, as Rip just talked about, have a slowing growth rate in 23-24. Subsequent to um, our projections being made, there are a few points. So BOM have since come out officially and said that the La Nina will end in mid-autumn and we will move in the ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index, into a neutral phase by the middle of the year. So we won't be in either La Nina or El Nino, we'll be neutral, which should provide us with average conditions. The other piece of advice that has come out post uh, the projection since January is that the Indian Ocean Dipole, which me measures the temperature in the Arabian Sea compared to um, in compared to the Indian Ocean in uh, Bali or Indonesia and looks at the differentials uh, there. So that's the Indian Ocean Dipole. When we have an Indian Ocean Dipole that is negative, Southern Australia gets wetter conditions. And what BOM has provided an update is by July, we will be in a ne negative Indian Ocean Dipole. Currently, we're in a neutral state. So we expect a wetter, wetter winter and spring in Southern Australia. So that really underpins that 2022 will be a strong year and through to 2023, 2024, we see seasonal conditions sort of um, tapering off. That's great, Sting. I mean, that's a that's a great ex explanation of a very complex topic. Um, next question, Rip. Um, we know that the AWI MLA sheep meat and wool survey triannual survey uh, measures producer in intentions. Do the results of the survey align with the 2022 projection numbers? Yeah, Jaffa, good question. They do. They definitely align with what our our first release of the projections uh, deliver for for this year. And and from that, we can we can actually look into what those numbers um, are, are or the story they're telling us. And you can see that 34% of producers from the October 2021 wave were intending on increasing flock numbers over the next 12 months, and a further 57% were looking to maintain the numbers. Uh, over the next 12 months that, that they currently have on farm. So overall, that's a 91% of producers nationally looking to ma either maintain or increase their flock numbers uh, over the next 12 months, which really demonstrates the, the seasonal confidence that producers have, the confidence in the market, um, and then you know the, the availability of pasture um, for, for sheep obviously to graze on and, and looking at a more broader term, the medium term outlook and demand for Australian sheep meat on a global level. When we then take a step back or, or a step deeper, we look at the ways in which producers are intending to, pardon me, increase those, those flock numbers and we see that 39% of producers nationally are looking to retain more older ewes than normal. That figure has softened from 2% uh, from 41% sorry, to 39% from the last wave. And then sort of moving forwards, how producers are looking um, to retain more replacement use than normal was at 55%. That softened 8% from 63% uh, from the June 2021 wave as well. And we certainly know over the last 18 months, the uptake of joining new lambs and that you know extra year that producers get um, from a breeding perspective has been really positive and contributed to the increase in the flock size, which we've, we've spoken about. And then finally, that figure of 30% where 30% of producers are looking to purchase more additional use than normal, that, um, that numbers remain stable wave on wave. Thanks, Rip. Good stuff. Uh, Steve, back to yourself. If producers are looking to retain more ewe lambs, then what is the forecast for lamb slaughter in 2022? And will the retention of ewe lambs then impact slaughter levels? No, so we saw it also happen in 2021. So we're having, when we have a larger lamb cohort, it allows producers to not only retain more, but also sell more. 
because um, there's a greater number of lambs to, you know, greater population of lambs. So slaughter in uh, 2022, we have rising 7% to 21.6 million head. And one of the points, one of the reasons is 2021 was a really strong lamb and sizable lamb cohort in 2021. Um, but we had some processor disruptions in late, uh, late spring due to uh, Victorian restrictions to, to 80%. So some of those uh, 2021 lambs didn't work processed in 2021, so they'll fall into 2022. So that's likely to increase 2022 slaughtering. Also on top of that, and we expect that those sort of um, lambs to be an influx in, in sort of the first half of 2022, we expect uh, that 2022 will also be a large lamb cohort because of favourable seasonal conditions in WA and uh, New South Wales and Victoria. So not only do we have large cohort at 2021, which are still to hit the market, we also expect a large cohort in 2022. So that's why we've got slaughter rising 7% to 21.6 million head. As we go through to 2023, we've got, again, that large cohort of 2022 lambs. Some of them will be hitting the market and, and the, her, um, the flock will be maturing. So we have 22.6 million head uh, of lambs uh, being slaughtered in that year. So we have got growth on year on year of slaughter through to 2023. Hmm, good stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Sting. Um, Rip, um, one of your um, favourite discussion points, um, how is the sheep slaughter expected to perform in 2022? Yeah, thanks, Jaffa. So uh, firstly, I'll start with last year. MLA has sheep slaughter in 2021 at its um, at its lowest volume since 2011. And you'll see the figure in 2016 was also lower than, than the years either side of it. They were rebuild years for the national flock. So when we look now in the way that 2022 is moving, we're expecting that 5.1 million head figure to rise by 17% this year to 6 million head. Um, and, and as a part of that, we're expecting that flock, or, or it's a sign to us that the flock growth is maturing, whereby new turnoff is increasing or improving, and um, and as a result of that, you know th those those really no, low numbers last year were directly correlated to more producers retaining older ewes than normal, which I just discussed about in the MLA AWI sheep meat and wool survey results. Producers retaining more older ewes than normal, which was, you know, a part of their their intentions, has ensured those slaughter numbers were lower. But looking ahead this year and and onwards, uh, 2023, we expect, pardon me, sheep slaughter volumes to rise by two million head to eight million head, and that that increase, um, it's not unusual to see, and it demonstrates that the flock growth is maturing where ewe turnoff improves, um, and you'll see between 2011 and 20. 12 and 13, pardon me, that, that substantial rise in sheep slaughter volumes on the back of a, of a rebuild year, which is what we're actually seeing at the minute as well. And from that out to 2024, we expect those numbers to continue to grow to 8.3 million head. Um, and, you know, as, as a result of the, 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 the La Nina, pardon me, sheep slaughter is expected to increase between now and 2024 by 65% in, in the two years following this one. Again, it's it's occurred previously. We know between 2011 and that 2013 figure and between 2016 and 18, the same thing occurred. So this, it's, it's not unusual to see this happen um, before. And, you know, when we look at historics, in 2018 and 2019 alone, over 18 million sheep were slaughtered during those drought years. So that's a really significant um, impact on, on the, the sheep supply, you'd say, and obviously a large percentage of those were females. So, you know, the low slaughter volumes over the last two years really do demonstrate the importance and the significance producers have, have placed on retaining, you know, ewes that may have been um, a little bit older to 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 capture and capitalise on those seasonal opportunities that that has continued to deliver and rebuild their flock and grow their numbers. Thanks, Rip. Um, guys, I might just interject at this point and just remind people that they're more than willing to sort of um, uh, take questions on the Q and A feature up on the top right hand side of your screen. Um, cheers. I suppose the next question I have is uh, I suppose I'll put it to Steve. But could you explain how carcass weights are expected to perform 
Yeah, so we've got carcass weights hitting um, record levels this year and next at 25 and 25.1 million head next uh, this year at 25 million, next year at 25.1 million head. So, so that's a... Um, but they're record carcass weights that we're talking about. In as we go forward into 2023, we have uh, sorry 2024. We have carcass weights dropping back to 24.5 kilos. So that's a, a bit of a drop, but that is in line with what our projections are showing with that client with the the flock mature, the flock rebuild maturing, and also the turn in seasonal or the stabilization in seasonal conditions. At the moment, there's a reason, a lot of reasons uh, for the weight gain. There's a lot of grain a lot of grass um, and, the, and the conditions for growing lambs are good. So we do expect that to wane slightly in 2024, back to 24.5 million head. But encouragingly, those two years, 2022, 2023, record carcass weights at 25 and 25.1 million head are expected. If we move to sheep carcass weights, carcass weights are expected to decline in 2022 by 1.2%. Out to 2024, similar condition, similar situation to what we're expecting with lambs is that we do have, uh, a, a, as those seasonal conditions sort of fluctuate, we expect that um, sheep carcass weights will ease back to 24.9%. Uh, 24.9 kilos ahead into 2024. So these are still record high carcass weights, even in 2024 when we have that dip. But uh, the encouraging piece is we, we are seeing those records these next two years. And it's largely driven by seasonal conditions, Jaffa. Hmm, okay, very interesting. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sting. Um, I might switch back to, to Ripley. But can you explain to us where you see production performing this year? Yeah, Jaffa. So in 2022, uh, we're expecting land production to reach a new record of 540,000 tonnes. That'll be 7.5% higher than our 2021 volumes, and then 4.5% higher than when the previous record was set, which was the year of 2016. We knew in 2016 uh, that was a very, or, or last, like nationally strong year um, for, the, for the sheep flock. And then on the back of what we're seeing, this record, um, production, it's underpinned by the, the increase in slaughter weights. And as Steve just mentioned, those historically high carcass weights we're seeing in lambs now rising this year to 25 kilos per head. That record lamb production overall, we expect to flow into the export market, which is which is really positive for the industry. This year, we're seeing exports or we're expecting exports to reach record levels of 307,000 tonnes ship weight. Uh, and then looking further at sheep, it's going to be this year in production terms, the third lowest on record behind 2021 and behind 2011, which I did discuss uh, moments ago regarding the, they were rebuild years nationally for the flock and growth years in terms of producers in intentions on retaining, um, you know, retaining sheep to, to increase numbers. Looking forwards out to 2023, land production forecast to grow again to 567,000 tonnes, um, slaughter weights, pardon me, slaughter volumes and carcass weights underpinning this. Um, 2024, we expect that figure to soften, but land production in 2023, we expect to be higher than 2021 numbers by 13%. Uh, in 2022 for land production, that increase is expected, you know, to continue next year to flow on into exports reaching 314,000 tonnes. That'll be 7,000 tonnes than the record uh, we set this year. And again, the 2023 figure would be higher by 11% than 2021 numbers. In 2023 and 24 for sheep production, um, that large uptick of 2 million head in 2023 for uh, sheep slaughter volumes, we expect to translate into increased production, rising over 200,000 tonnes um, and rising again to 208,000 tonnes in 2024. That uh, increase in production and obviously on the back of, of strong slaughter volumes is going to translate into an improvement on uh, mutton exports, which you'll see in 23, 161,000 tonnes exported and in 2024, 165,000 tonnes exported. That 2024 figure of 165,000 tonnes would be a 58% improvement on those 2021 volumes, which really demonstrates um, the the forecast positivity and improvement in that in that mutton supply to to our global markets but um i think the caveat to that is we have spoken about records with lamb production domestically and then lamb production exports but 
there won't be any records broken in sheep production volumes domestically or exports over the next three years, Jaffa. Hmm. Cheers, mate. Just rip sticking with you, mate. Um, how do you see the La Nina effects uh, on the NTLI and onwards to land throughput? Yeah, Jeff, a really, really interesting question you ask. And the market information team did some analysis on this piece. And between 20, between November of 2010 and the 2nd of March of 2011, we saw the national trade lamb indicator rise by 36 percent or 174 cents a kilo carcass weight to reach the record uh, set on the 2nd of March at 658 cents a kilo carcass weight. This that that pricing level broke records, and it wasn't it wasn't a level that the industry had ever seen at a national level before. And it took a further six years until April of 2017 for that figure to be broken again. That coincided with the the peak of that of that 2010 to 2012 La Nina period. And you know during those couple of years of really favourable wet wet conditions for for the eastern seaboard. You know the strength of summer uh, and and you know sp spring moving into summer over you know November into January March where we saw that record broken mm. that challenged you know producers ability to limit weight gains in lambs which which saw um, an increase in in heavy lamb supply but then a tightening in supply of the of the trade weight spec which is similar to the current circumstances the industry is experiencing at the minute and when that supply peaked. Uh, when that price peaked, sorry, the the supply was relatively tight, you know, due to those due to due to the increase in heavy lambs um, coming onto the market. Again, it's a similar situation to what may occur in in this year, coinciding with with the second year of of the La Nina, same to a decade ago, and as a result of that that tightening of supply on on trade weight availability, it may place increased demand and upward pressure on those trade weight prices moving forward, Jaffa. Ah, okay. Yeah, interesting stuff. Thanks, mate. Um, I might switch back to yourself, Sting. Um, earlier when you discussed flock growth, you mentioned WA's sort of rebuild intentions following that great 2021 season. Um, look, given that WA is, is the main live sheep exporting site, how does the live export forecast look for 2022? Well, as you'll see in that red box down the bottom there, Jaffa, 2021 was the lowest uh, number of sheep exported since uh, 1969. Uh, and, and in that year, only 396,000 sheep were exported. We've got growth of 25,000 head or 4.3% in 2022. It's growth but it's still from a really, really low level and we'll be hitting um, 600,000 head there. So we've seen growth, which is encouraging, but still at historically uh, low levels in, in a historical context. When we look at 2023 and out, um, the lambs bought in, born in 2021 will flow on to uh, shipper weights in, in late 2022, 2023. So in 2023, we are seeing um, some growth in, uh, in, in exports. It's slight, that'll be to 630, um, so 5% growth in, in 2023. But we're starting to we'll start to see those merino shippers hit hit the ground and then as we go out into uh, 2024 we expect uh, 700,000 uh, sheep to be exported and that'll be 22% increase on 2021 levels. A few of the positives are um, obviously the merino weather flock sort of underpin the live export trade to some extent and when we did do the AWI MLA survey in October 89% of WA breeding ewes are merinos so that's a positive. There's still going to be those uh, merino weathers available to flow into the live export market, especially when that rebuild in WA grows into late 2022, 2023. One piece I would state is that, and a caveat, Rip just gave a caveat, is the merino percentage of breeding ewes uh, nationally has fallen uh, in the last sort of 12 months, but the merino breeding ewe percentage in just looking at WA has fallen from 95.6% of all breeding ewes in WA in June 2020 were, were merinos. We fast forward to October 2021 and only 89% of breeding ewes in, uh, in WA Marino. So that's a fall of 6% in the space of a year. So that is one thing to watch out for when we look sort of into the live exports and, and sheep demographics going forward. 
one of the positives is is that UAE and Oman have sort of increased their live exports or, or stayed rather steady. So uh, that that underpins that there is that demand in those MENA markets, Middle East and North Africa markets, for Australian live export um, sheep. The piece that follows is probably. Um, that, that, that the summer moratorium has hurt us. Um, there is definitely evidence that uh, Middle East countries are looking to uh, countries that can support uh, sheep supply 12 years, uh, 12 months of the year. So that is one of the challenges. The other challenge uh, facing the live sheep export market is the drop of the Qatari government subsidies. So um, Qatar used to, in 2020, uh, they took 180,000 head of live uh, Australian sheep. In 2020, when that uh, when that uh, subsidy was ended, they didn't take any. So so watching what is happening in uh, Qatar or it, it has affected the live sheep trade. The other encouraging piece, but it's still a watch and, and monitor the situation is Saudi Arabia. So we know that we've signed all the protocols to enter the Saudi Arabian live sheep market again in 2021, though to date no sheep have gone there yet. OK, thanks, Steve. Um, probably another question to yourself. Sting. Um, so inflation has placed pressure on discretionary items uh, and look, the entire economy in Australia sort of throughout 2021. Can you tell us a little bit more about the d about domestic consumption of Australian land? Definitely. So uh, between 2021, uh, 2020, 2015 and 2021, the price of our lamb did lift 40%. But interestingly, the Eastern State Trade Lamb Indicator lifted 57%. So there is Someone in that supply chain processes or retailers is taking, absorbing some of those gains, uh, livestock gains, and not passing them on to the consumer, which is it is encouraging. It shows that the supply chain is resilient and has the ability to absorb. One of the key things we've seen, it's a structural trend we've seen, is nearly um, nearly a billion dollars a month is being spent in Australia on uh, online food orders. And that's flowing through to lamb sales. Lamb sales, though, interestingly enough, um, ha are selling better in bricks and mortar stores than they are online. Um, so their share of total online sales is smaller than that of the bricks and mortar. But really encouragingly is, is the lamb's price at retail in 2021 remained stable, while some other commodities and uh, it, it, there, there was an increase in price that was far more than what lamb's was. So, so that's been a really encouraging point from the land perspective. Um, and then what we do have is that we do know that domestic consumption did fall, we expected to fall a little bit uh, in 2021, just based because the supply wasn't necessarily uh, there. We do have it coming on as we come into record levels in 2022 and 2023. We do have uh, consumption expected to go back to 2020 and 2019 levels around 6.6 .6 kilograms per person. So that's really encouraging. Good, good, good. Um, I suppose the next di discussion item is, I suppose, maybe to both Rip and Sting. Um, Look, I think it's fair to say that on the production side, side of the ship industry for 2022 outlook, you know, there's a lot of positives that we can take. Um, and after reading, you know, the projections, I see that you've sort of outlined some of the key macro issues that you expect to see impact in the industry this year and, and onwards, obviously. Um, can you expand on those a little bit more for me, please? Yeah, Jaffa, thank you. I'll begin with the, the National Flock Demographics and also uh, the shearing issue. Firstly, I'll reference our MLA, AWI sheep, meat and wool survey again. And the data from producers between the October, uh, between the June and October waves of 2021, sorry, the percentage of Merino ewes compared to the total um, breeding ewe flock overall fell by 4% from 76% to 72%. This was the first time that uh, Merino uses a percentage of the national flock was under 75%. That's a constant trend um, downwards for as, as the Merino U percentage overall that we've been watching and it's steadily declined since 2020. As an example, that demonstrates to us producers are looking to slowly move away from, from the Merino into a first cross and crossbred U, you know, focused production system. Um, and, and as I expand on that, I think these next two points point to why we're seeing this, uh, this situation evolve and how we recognise it um, as a key macro issue for the flock in 2022. I'll begin with shearing. 
um, border restrictions, quarantine and other COVID-19 induced challenges, restricting the ability for New Zealand shearers to enter Australia, you know, over the last two years during the pandemic and um, demand for shearers domestically as, as the flock grows has increased due to that, that shortfall that we traditionally see improve from the, from the Kiwis coming over. That hasn't happened due to the, the reasons I just mentioned. But I think another caveat to make about that is the shearing issue has been prevalent in the Australian sheep industry um, prior to COVID. You know, this isn't, COVID just didn't, didn't begin this situation. It was a problem before COVID occurred. On the back of that increased demand with the flock growing and, and the need for producers to get wool off a of sheep's back, they've been required, you know, to pay above the award rate, um, you know, across the industry to secure access to their shearers or to, to shearers to, to shear their sheep, placing further pressure on those margins of, you know, of the producer and, and the, the net profit they, they return with due, due to those higher costs of shearing, um, you know. On the back of that and access to two shearers, it's also ballooned out the time between shearings, which as we know for the productivity of the national flock and, and flocks on farm in general, it, it, it does have an impact. When we look at the markets, um, comparing the Eastern Market Indicator and the Eastern States Trade Lamb Indicator, the EMI but since February 2019 and um, has fallen by 28%, to 1,389 cents a kilo. During that same period from February 2019, the National Trade Lamb Indicator has appreciated by 30% uh, up to 865 cents a kilo carcass weight. That, um, you know, that issue there or the, the disparity between the EMI falling and the, the National Trade Lamb Indicator improving really demonstrates the, the offering or the, the improvement in margins that uh, the sheep meat industry is affording, while the wool industry, um, as an indicator and its benchmark, has softened. But I think it's it is fair to say, and that is a caveat. the The 2022 start for the AMI and the wool industry and the wool market has started quite strongly. Steve. So I'd just add on to that. There's one other um, macro issue. Uh, is, is is to do with uh, labour. So there's the what there's the issue of getting um, labour and and so what migration. The lack of migration for the last two years has played a part on um, the labour pool, both from farm farm gate. If we look at you know backpackers working as farm hands right through to skilled migrants working in boating room floors. So there has been a, a shrinking of the labour pool for agriculture as a whole, which is something that the industry will have to deal with going forward uh, into 2022, 2023, 2024. The other piece is because of that uh, smaller labour pool is that we've seen um, agriculture have to complete, compete with freight uh, mining and construction, which has pushed up the cost of uh, labour for the industry. So they're two labour issues that we are um, monitoring. Yeah, good points. Thing, cheers, mate. Um, to make sticking with yourself. So look, it's been mentioned that you know land production for exports um, is forecast to reach record levels this year. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the export markets are looking? So from a, again, sort of a more macro level, there's a few things. There's Firstly, the, the the shipping and freight issue. So um, it's very hard at the moment to get empties, refrigerated empty containers sent to Australia because there's so much global shipping uh, congestion and disruptions happening. Um, there's issues at ports globally, and as a result, uh, shipping companies don't want to send empty containers to a country if they're, they're not filled with anything. So Australia is struggling to get access to, to um, refrigerated empty containers. There's also the issue, um, so a lot of shipping lines are really, really prioritising that US, popular US to China route. So it is hard to get a boat deviated down to Australia. Um, so that's been a real issue. There's also been the shipping costs has gone exploded. Um, the ACCC did a report last year, and in some routes out of Australia, the cost has increased by 700%, which is just putting cost pressures on exporters. And then there's also been obviously the reduction in air traffic movements into Australia and out of Australia, given um, the border controls. So there's been an issue. There are issues that we really see that will affect the movement of um, product. But there are some positives. I mean, if we look at 
I'll move away from sort of some of the macro issues. And if we look at just a market that has shown some really in, uh, positivity, is has been the US. It, it grew 16% or 995 um, tons. So it became Australia's largest lamb exporter uh, last year. So the US has really provided some really solid opportunities um, in, in 2021, which is a real positive, especially given that all those freight issues still uh, were, were still an issue then. Um, one of the reasons for the US uh, growing is the US flock is it declining and there has been an uptake in uh, consumption of lamb and sort of growing a taste for our product. The other piece I'd touch on is the OECD forecast. So the OECD forecast expects 18.4 million tonnes to be the global consumption of sheep meat by the end of 2030. That's a growth of 14%. A lot of that growth in the next uh, eight years will be from countries that are both increasing their consumption but also increasing their um, domestic production. So China in the same period is expected to grow consumption by 11 percent but um, grow production by 11.4 percent. But there will still be an export gap, especially in the US. So at the US, the flock is expected to uh, shrink, but their demand for uh, for sheep meat imports is expected to stay the same. So we expect that there's still to be an opportunity in the US. But I think that big one is that OECD 14% growth in sheep meat um, consumption in the next 10 years. Australia will real, is, is really, Australia and New Zealand are the only countries set to meet any real serious um, export opportunities in the sheep meat market. And in New Zealand, the move to uh, dairies has, and, and sort of some um, land use changes that have gone on there have really limited their ability to compete with Australia meaningfully going forward. So we really see that Australia is really the best placed um, market going forward to meet the export uh, demand and the ever growing increase in sheep meat consumption. Thanks, Sting. Interesting. Um, so sticking with yourself, mate. Um, so what has been the situation for lamb exports in 2022 so far? Uh, lamb exports for the start of this year have been very, very favourable. Um, so they've been up at 27% or 3,461 uh, tonnes. So it's been good. US has uh, remained a strong, um, growing by 35% or 122, 1,226 tonnes. South Korea continued its strong finish to last year um, and it's, it's grown 81 percent and PNG there's a lot of growth in what PNG offers so so there's some been some really good um, stats to start the year in in the land market thanks Dean um, I might switch over to rip now rip can you tell us about mutton exports um, in 2022 and and onwards yeah, Jaffa, thank you. So in 2021, uh, we saw mutton exports firm only higher by 1% overall to 140,000 tonnes shipped weight. At the export type uh, between chilled and frozen product, chilled was back 11%, but the overall um, volume of shipped mutton exports at a chilled um, refrigeration style is minimal, um, but Secondly, as a caveat to that, there was the continued impact of access to refrigerated containers, which contributed to that 11% decline. Frozen exports were firm, uh, overall high by 1%. But when we look, you know, um, I think at the two leaders, certainly uh, China and, and the US, China's stability or improvement of 3% and the growth of the US, I think that that rise of 3% from China really demonstrates its dominance. You know, there's daylight between China and, and US um, as Australia's second largest mutton exporting nation um, in comparison to or, or in volume terms. And, you know, the US, for example, that 27% increase, Steve, Steve mentioned it earlier, was the domestic um, flock production in the states declining or constricting due to seasonal conditions and changes in production systems. And that continued growth in consumer demand from, from the US population to consume you know, Australian sheep meat products has, has been really favourable to see. Looking ahead into 2022, China um, has started quite strongly again, and the US uh, and Malaysia, interestingly, in a, in a similar situation, um, closely followed by the US in, in the third spot. But I think when we look at the, the mutton exports for the next decade, the OECD is forecasting growth of 23.6% in sheep meat consumption for 
uh, for Malaysia. And on the back of this for Australia, that's a really positive thing to see, knowing that we have the Malaysia-Australia Free Trade Agreement. And this, you know, that, that establishment some time ago of that um, free trade agreement has ensured Australia has tariff-free access to that market. So it provides us a really strong opportunity to access the increased consumption over the next decade from those Malaysian consumers. When we look, you know, on a on a competitor level, we know that the US is uh, the US, pardon me, New Zealand are our key um, competitors on a global scale for for sheep meat exports. The long term improvement in dairy production and export demand of of New Ze of New Zealand milk solids uh, and milk products or dairy products um, from the global market, you know, asking that of New Zealand has placed increasing pressure on the land use between sheep meat and dairy production, uh, you know, within the country. And as a result of that, and, and the way that situation is playing out as the continued demand for New Zealand dairy product remains strong, it's, it's placing Australia in a really favourable position to continue as the only country globally with the transport infrastructure and the production systems established, capable of focusing on, on exporting sheep meat, um, you know, to meet that global demand from consumers, from those emerging markets that were spoken about, such as Malaysia, but then also the established markets like China and the US, which is really exciting to see. Um, although there is a caveat to that, and, and we know that Australia's production of sheep meat will never be sufficient to meet the global demand. Um, it, what it does allow, though, is Australia um, to, to direct product into channels, um, you know, of need and certainly of demand for, for the quality of, of Australian sheep meat that we produce, uh, produce, sorry, as, you know, a fresh, traceable and safe, um, you know, sheep meat product, which Australia at an international level is renowned for, Jaffa. Thanks, Rip. Very, very good. Um, so look, thanks, Sting. Thanks, Rip, for, I suppose, answering my questions. Um, I think you've provided some really significant insight into um, into into the projections. Um, I suppose it's time now to switch to some of those questions that um, our participants have posted on our Q&A board. Um, so first up... Uh, Robert uh, Herman there, Jaffa. Yeah, yeah. So uh, from Robert, um, he was asking, you know, is it correct accounting to include you know, the intention to purchase more ewes as an increase when those ewes are already in the flock? So, Robert, we get the actual numbers, the expected number of the flock and lamb sales over the next 12 months. So that is from a producer perspective. But with that 34% uh, that are expected to increase uh, their flock, their breeding ewes in the next 34, uh, the 34% of producers that are looking to increase their breeding use in the next 12 months of that 55 percent are doing it through retaining more replacement use so that's that's uh that's that and then 39 are doing uh, by retaining more older use than usual so what that's doing is when rick talked about sheep slaughter uh being depressed it's because those sheep aren't coming onto the market so what that rebuild what that rebuild looks at is it looks at those sheep not being stripped out of the uh, market i'd say as opposed to necessarily those um sheep already being in the system and as you say 30 percent are looking at purchasing more um sheep more additional use but that's 30 percent of 34 percent so that comes down to to around 12 percent 11 percent that, that's Steve. already in the system um thanks I, I, Oh, sorry. Sorry, Jaffa. <laughs> sorry, Sting, cutting across you there, mate. Um, cheers, mate. Sorry, were you finished? I was just going to go on to the next question, but that's your job, the anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I might I might break um, break the next question down to maybe a couple of different bits and pieces. Um, it's to do with production and its relationship on, on prices. Um, I suppose the first section is, is how much of the increased production in this coming year or two can the domestic market absorb with the very high retail prices and you know is then price expected to um you know then come down well I suppose the piece is rick touched on it in his last section and i did as well in the macro issues around exports is globally we're having 40 percent growth in sheep meat uh consumption in the next 10 years and given how much we do export of our product the the product will chase the dollar uh, that that you know that is what will happen is the product if, if the dollar 
and, and the price and the value is attached to export markets. That is where the land will go with that increased uh, production. Though what we have seen is we have seen in 2021 prices for land were relatively stable compared to other protein. So that's the really encouraging piece. The price highs that we've seen were in 2020 and 2021. We, you know, um, we do have expected production to increase. So we don't see any spikes happening um, uh, you know, from the retail end. We, we don't forecast what retail prices will, where they will go. But if we look at that, 2021 was stable. And then we look at, you know, when the prices have peaked in, in sale yards and they have been in sub in previous years. Thanks, Sting. Um, good stuff. I was just going to ask participants if, if they could bear with us for um, another four to five minutes. Uh, I know we've got a late start, but we've got some really interesting questions here that we wouldn't mind uh, working through. Um, so just cracking on with that, um, we were asked, did the absolute number of Merino use decrease or was it the crossbred use increase? It, it did decrease. So I have the, the figures there. Um, so in, um, in October 2020, there were 30.45 million Merino use and and there were a total of 40.72 total breeding ewes nationally. So that's 2020. We fast forward to 2021 and the uh, Merino flock was, Merino percentage was 30.26. So the Merino number fell, but the total breeding ewes on hand increased to 41.76. So people are holding on to those first cross, or those, you know, those crossbred ewes, yeah. young crossbred <laughs> Okay, very good. Thanks, Mike. Um, moving on to the next question, um, just in regards to export markets, and uh, you know, um, and uh, the participant here identified that each market does have differing tastes and, and preferences, um, particularly in some of those markets that have seen good, strong growth. Is there a is there a cut preference, you know, between those different between those different export markets? Try that one. Rip, do you want to uh, answer that one? Yeah, yeah, I am happy to answer that one. And it's an interesting question the the listener or the attendee has, um, you know, has brought to our attention. And when you look at the way that different consumers from across the globe consume sheep meat, it it does depend uh, on on what sort of style of cooking they're one accustomed to, and two they're educated on understanding how to actually prepare Australian lamb or, or mutton, for example. So, in markets such as uh, such as the Asian countries, you do see a lot of you know particularly frozen mutton going into hot pot style um, hot pot style cooking methods. Pardon me, and then in different environments such as the more westernised US, you'll see those, you know, roasts, for example, cutlets um, are, are more prominent where, you know, there, there's some barbecue style of, of beef on the barbecue, um, you know, during during the summer of the US is, is quite prominent. So it really depends on the region that you're talking at, at a global level. Uh, in regards to, you know, heavy and bag lambs, the, the other markets such as MENA prefer to, to actually take whole carcasses. So that'll be again dependent on on the end um, market or end country it's going into. So the difference really is about um, the education of the consumer on how to prepare the product. Like you'll see um, cut throughout Asia, either in hot pot style or Korean barbecue, for example, they'll take, um, you know, cuts and then slice them into thinner uh, pieces to then consume uh, over a Korean barbecue in that South Korean market. So it does depend on on the end end consumer, their knowledge, their appreciation, and their education on on how to prepare that Australian sheep meat. Okay. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Guys, I've got time for one more question, and um, and this one here is just around, uh, I suppose, competition in the um, in the international market. Um, you know, with um, <clears throat> You know, given that New, New Zealand is starting to, you know, look into favour land use for the for the dairy, um, you know, where do we see our competition coming from uh, in the next five to ten years? Um, or potentially, you know, will Australia get to dominate the market in the medium term? That's what we're sort of seeing, Jaffa, is at the moment when we look at um, export f figures, is a lot of it is, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, <laughs> And then there's gap between between the third producer, um, and and often um, the UK comes in there. But one of the things that we expect to see is that what the OECD does look at is in that 18 
1.4 million um, tons of sheep meat consumption by the end of 2030 and that growth of 14 percent is there will be a lot of domestic uh, production growth so be that in the middle east be that romania be that you know iran there will be increased consumption but also increased domestic production so um you could say that one of the big uh, competitors is actually going to be the domestic uh, production in some of these countries. I think just quickly to add to that, uh, the question, you know, regarding that growth, for example, uh, sheep meat exports to the US are dominated by Australia and New Zealand. So Australia and New Zealand make up 98.2% of total sheep meat exports to the states. That as an example in terms of, um, you know, competitor bases or the two leading, you know, sheep meat um, producers and exporters globally, I think as an example really demonstrates the position that Australia is in to continue to, to strengthen that that or or it's or it's opportunity to continue to strengthen its position as a as a global exporter of sheep meat and as Steve touched on that that situation and the growth of fourteen percent um, improvement globally as another example China's domestic consumption is expected to increase by eleven point two percent over the next decade but its domestic production of sheep meat is expected to increase by ten point nine percent so there is a bit of a gap there but that. That domestic consumption on a global level will improve, but um, you know, as an exporting sort of question that that this listeners asked, when you look at the situation and the leading um, representation of Australia and New Zealand, and and the leading um, sort of production volumes they have in that sector, really does demonstrate the opportunity that Australia has to you know continue to 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 strengthen. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Sting, for those for those uh, for those answers. Really, really useful stuff, um, guys. I'm just going to close close um, close close the Q and A session now. Uh, I know time is is is, is tight for all of us, um, and I'd like to sort of um, just say that uh, any any questions that we haven't gotten to just then, we'll make sure that uh, we get answers back out to us. Um, look, I appreciate everyone's time and participation today, and and um, look, I'd like to say thanks again for your patience at the very um, beginning of the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to hand over to Sting. Uh, I think you're on mute there, Steve. I am, thanks, you'd think I'd know. Um, so I really appreciate everyone for jumping on today and for working and, and staying with us when we had the technical issues at the start. Uh, we apologize for that, um, but we really appreciate everyone's sort of uh, patience. Um, that brings the end of the projections presented by the market information team. I'd like to thank Steve Jaffrey from the NLRS uh, for jumping in and moderating and Rip for his contribution. I think I'd just like to um, get your feedback as you guys do log off. Um, with, there's a survey in the uh, Q&A section, but also you will be prompted to fill one out. Uh, we want to continue to change how we offer our market information products, the insights we have and, and whether these webinars work, whether you want to see them for other products that we do. Um, and we want you guys, these webinars and our products to be as useful for you guys. So we would really like your feedback so we can shape them that way. As outlined at the start, a recording will be made available shortly. A PDF of the slide deck will be made upon made available upon request. And if your questions weren't answered today, I know there are nine that we didn't get to. We will we will take them offline and make a, a, a conscious um, effort to, to respond to you guys. Um, so our contact details are now on the on the um, on the screen. Don't hesitate to reach out to Ripley, myself or, or Steve Jaffrey if you have any indicator NLRS questions um, and thank you for jumping on uh, today and we hope you guys really enjoyed it. Thanks guys.